Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. This is Pranitha Gupta at the Center for Law and Social Policy, CLASP. On behalf of CLASP and my colleague Janice Fine and the Rutgers Center for Innovation and Worker Organization, we want to welcome you to today's webinar. We're really excited to bring you our final webinar on labor standards enforcement in 2017. Today, we're excited to have an excellent group of speakers joining us to talk about strategic enforcement. They'll talk about their current practices and walk you through some important cases. The interest in this topic has just been amazing. We have over 150 people participating on this call today from 19 states, 18 cities and counties, and 23 organizations. We hope that you will ask questions, but given the volume of people participating today, we ask that you submit a written question by typing it into the question box as indicated on the slide. I know we have um, another option to raise your hand. We're asking you not to do that today just because of time constraints. So please write in your question in the question box and we will get to it and make sure uh, we um, recognize your question. Also, if you have a question for a particular speaker, please just put the name of the speaker you want um, to have answer your question. This call is being recorded by class so that we can share it with all of you. So we ask that no one else record this call. So with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Janice Fine. Hi, everybody. We're really excited uh, to bring this call about strategic enforcement. Um, my own work, I've surveyed about uh, more than 50 state and local agencies. And what's always been interesting is that most agree on the importance of going beyond complaint-based enforcement to strategic or directed enforcement, but often feel challenged to do so when demands on agencies are so great and resources are so thin. In previous webinars, we've looked at triage processes that help to free up time and resources for proactive targeted enforcement efforts. Triage is a system an agency uses to sort cases into different treatment categories and to decide which complaints to prioritize for full investigations. We wanted to organize this webinar to help people think about how to get started down a path of strategic enforcement that fits your own agency, how to take the, the next steps. And we're hoping to unpack and demystify this process. Each of our wonderful presenters will use a case study to walk through the key steps and lessons. Because time is tight, we'd like to turn immediately to our speakers. David Weil, formerly the Wage and Hour Administrator at the US Department of Labor, Donna Nass, Wage and Hour Investigator, at the Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development, Risa Spaziani, Field Supervisor at the Wage and Work Workplace Standards Department at the Connecticut Department of Labor, and Renika Moore, Labor Bureau Chief at the Office of the New York Attorney General. Today's webinar will go until 2.15 to ensure adequate time for questions, and we will have two opportunities for Q&A, the first time after our first two speakers, and then again after our last two speakers. And with that, we'll begin with the guru of strategic enforcement, David Weil. Well, thank you very much, Janice and Pranita, uh, for uh, inviting me to participate and seeing the list of state and local, uh, as well as worker advocacy organizations. I see a lot of uh, friends and, and colleagues, and so I'm all the more delighted to be with you today. Um, I do want to sort of take a uh, look down uh, at the look down memory lane at the wage and hour experience that uh, I had the good fortune of being at, along with my colleagues on this call, Laura Fortman, uh, where we really, I think, made uh, a lot of headway in developing the idea of strategic enforcement. But one of the things I want to emphasize throughout my my time is that strategic force enforcement is more than anything in my mind a way of thinking about uh, the, the the running the operation the leadership and the management of uh, an enforcement agency and i'll i'll talk about that in terms of looking back on our own experience um so uh, next slide please um uh, about a year ago, uh, it was uh, some of the final days of the Obama administration, and um, uh, we were thinking a lot about one case in, or we're thinking about a lot of cases, but one of the cases that certainly occupied a lot of my time uh, came out of uh, an investigation that we did at the Senate cafeteria. And to briefly just uh, remind uh, 
those of you who don't remember this case, in 2015, uh, a number of, uh, uh, well, Good Jobs Nation um, brought to public attention um, the conditions facing Senate cafeteria workers, in particular, their low rates of pay, uh, other uh, lack of benefits, working conditions, uh, the particularly evocative story of one Senate cafeteria worker, a 63-year-old uh, gentleman named Charles Gladden, um, who was actually homeless at the time as he was also uh, working at the Senate cafeteria. Uh, and Good Jobs Nation, uh, many folks on the Democratic side of the Hill uh, and other advocacy organizations brought these stories to public attention. Um, to make a long story short, somewhere in uh, late 2015, uh, the company that actually contracted the workforce at the Senate cafeteria, Restaurant Associates, reached a deal with um, uh, the workers at the Senate cafeteria raising their pay. Um, shortly after that, it was discovered that uh, Restaurant Associates had changed uh, the job classification of many of the workers who had actually received uh, allegedly that increase and had downgraded their um, uh, their occupational classification in a way that allowed restaurant associates essentially to move them back to the pay they had been paid uh, before all the public attention. Um, Good Jobs Nation came to the Wage and Hour Division. Wage and Hour Division conducted an investigation uh, of restaurant associates at the Senate cafeteria. And that particular investigation ended up bringing uh, back wages to uh, uh, almost 700 workers, uh, past and current Senate cafeteria workers, uh, above $1 million in back wages. Now, what's significant about this case, and the reason I want to reflect on this and use it as the anchor of my comments, is that uh, our approach in 2016 was fundamentally different from what we would have done uh, in 2009 at the beginning of the Obama administration. Um, and while we were very proud and while the million dollars we ultimately were able to recover for those workers uh, was incredibly important, what really differentiated that case was several other very important elements. Uh, First uh, was our ability to work closely with Good Jobs Nation uh, in moving ahead um, with that particular investigation at, at various stages. And uh, historically, uh, the Wage and Hour Division did not have close relationships with worker advocacy organizations. And in fact, in the Bush administration had almost been prescribed from working with worker advocates. Um, that, that relationship there and elsewhere was absolutely important. Uh, secondly, we looked broadly at the company we were dealing with. Um, and ultimately, our work was not just reaching a settlement at the Senate cafeteria, uh, but we began a whole series of investigations of many other facilities also managed by restaurant associates, including facilities at the Capitol Visitor Center, at the Federal Reserve Board, uh, and then in the Smithsonian institutions. Um, that was a very different thing for us to do, to look broadly at that particular entity, not just in terms of the place where the investigation had started, but in other places, Restaurant Associates was also serving as the contractor. Even beyond that, we started digging into who Restaurant Associates was. And we found out they were actually part of a much larger organization called Compass Group, which is a global uh, contracting uh, organization, uh, uh, a multi, multi-billion dollar operation. And in that work, we used new uh, capabilities we had developed over the eight years of the Obama administration to figure out violations, not only of the Service Contract Act, which was what the Senate cafeteria problems resolved, revolved around, but under other acts that we administered, including the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Family Medical Leave Act, and elsewhere, and not only of restaurant associates, but other affiliated companies with Compass Group. Now, the reason we did that was we were going to be using yet another tool we historically hadn't, but was very important to our strategic enforcement uh, approach. And that was uh, using tools like debarment, our ability under the Service Contract Act to 
um, uh, under our authority to uh, uh, not allow restaurant associates and other Compass Group affiliates to bid contracts with the federal government in the uh, uh, in the future. Uh, that's an incredibly strong uh, regulatory tool, but it was one that was in our toolbox, although seldom used. By using that, we were able to use another aspect of strategic enforcement, and that was negotiating a comprehensive agreement that went beyond simply compliance with the law at the particular facility, that being the, uh, the Senate cafeteria. And instead, uh, we crafted a very, very broad and um, complex in what we call an enhanced compliance agreement that would have prospectively covered other restaurant associates um, affiliated uh, uh, air, uh, companies as well as uh, we were looking into actually a more comprehensive agreement with the Compass Group that would have had huge implications going far beyond the Service Contract Act. Um, uh, and finally, uh, we used many tools of public engagement to let people understand what we were doing and why we were doing that. Um, and our ability to harness all of those different tools, our ability to get information together from all parts of the country, our many different wage and hour offices to find patterns of violations, not only of restaurant associates, but of the Compass Group, our ability to work closely with the solicitor's office, uh, so that we could pursue a debarment claim um, and our ability to have ongoing relationships with a variety of stakeholders as we deployed this very complicated strategy was something we were able to do in 2016 that we would not have been able to do as well in 2014 and would not have been able to do as well even further going back to 2012 and so on. And I tell you this story because intrinsic in our approach to strategic enforcement and the message I would give to all of you, regardless of the size of your uh, agency and the, and the uh, number of years you've been engaged in trying to think more broadly about enforcement, is this is an iterative process. This is a way of thinking through problems in order to ultimately have the greatest impact you can given the limited resources that any regulatory agency is always going to be operating under. So I, I, I really want to emphasize this isn't a story you have to be incredibly large, incredibly sophisticated to do strategic enforcement, uh, but it's much more thinking hard about the problem of how do you use your tools strategically in a way to really advance your compliance goal. Um, on the next slide I have, uh, really what would constantly ground us in everything we were doing on strategic enforcement. And that was our mission statement. Um, and I have on the slide here our, our mission statement that was adopted by our organization that I think was passionately believed in by uh, the men and women in both our career and our political staff at Wage and Hour, and that guided what we were working on. And it was what we always came back to in our discussions about were we using our tools effectively? We were we acting as an organization in a way ultimately that advanced this notion of achieving compliance compliance with labor standards in a more comprehensive way, or as I always like to say, uh, making sure we were achieving the notion of a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Um, now, doing that required a lot of different tools. Making strategic enforcement real required us working on a whole uh, bunch of different elements, uh, dimensions of strategic enforcement. And on the next slide, I have listed uh, really eight major elements that form, in my mind, the pieces of strategic enforcement. And I'm not saying every agency has to have all these pieces in place and that you have to have every initiative you undertake has to have all of them. But these are the kinds of features. I think if you look through this list, you'll see some of the things I've already talked about in uh, the Senate cafeteria case and that were tools and approaches we tried to hone over time. Uh, I'm not going to have time to talk about all of them. Let me just touch on a few of them and give you a sense of how we developed and refined these tools over the eight years of the Obama administration. Um, uh, first of all, uh, moving to a proactive approach, Janice already outlined, and, I, and you have had discussions in prior webinars about some of the elements of moving away from complaint-based in investigations. Well, on the next slide, let me show you how we were able to do that over time 
Um, these are two of my favorite slides. I would often use these in discussions with uh, uh, the leadership of, of Wage and Hour Division. Um, and let me just briefly show you what we're, we're charting in them. On the left slide um, depicts uh, um, several measures of how we were using our strategic enforcement tools. The dotted green line on the left side shows the percentage of investigations that we were doing on a on really a proactive, what we call directed basis. And what you can see is that green line went up over um, the eight years of the Obama administration to where uh, at the close of 2016, we had raised the number, the percentage of, of directed investigations to 46 percent. Um, from a level somewhere around 25% at the end of the uh, Obama, uh, Bush administration. Um, the other two lines you see on that slide are measures of the percentage of uh, investigations that we did uh, either as complaint investigations, and that's the blue line, or directed investigations, and that's the red line. And we charted what percentage of those investigations we go in and not find any problems. And what we were very proud about is particularly the downward trend of the red line, that over the time we did our work, we got better and better at finding those workplaces with major problems. Um, now, the reason I wanted to point out this particular slide is not so much at looking at what we achieved over the eight years, but the fact that we measured it and talked about it and looked at it constantly and over time got better and better at doing what we were doing. And the way we did that was through a constant discussion, a constant review of our efforts, constantly asking the question, what's working and what's not working? Um, it's also true, there's a management mantra, uh, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. Uh, and I think it's absolutely true, and it was certainly a core element of what we did. The two figures you see in front of you um, are figures that I would look at on every month uh, on a monthly basis with all of the senior people in the Washington office. Uh, I would review it with each of the regional administrators at the Wage and Hour Division, who in turn would review it with their staff. Uh, this was really the lifeblood of making sure we were focused on proactive investigation. Um, on the next slide, um, I have what is a very simple, what we called our strategic enforcement uh, equation. Um, and again, uh, this was a, a simple idea of saying, what is strategic enforcement? Well, it's number one, looking at evidence of violations and problems, and number two, thinking about what we called structural opportunities, which was really a shorthand to say, how might we actually affect the behavior of the employer or employers we were trying to change to improve compliance to achieve that mission? Um, and what I just would briefly say about this slide is, over time, we learned, again, through the process of doing, talking, and keeping focus on the idea of getting better and better at using our resources to achieve greater compliance on what was the kind of evidence we needed to gather, what evidence was useful, what was less useful, what turned out to have had impact and really tell us where the problems were versus where they weren't. Equally, discussing structural opportunity and trying different ways of using our enforcement tools uh, working with our partners in the solicitor's office and worker advocacy organizations uh, and sometimes business organizations to use structural opportunities. Our definitions of what each of those elements was, the evidence of violations and structural opportunities, and then very importantly, how we had to use both was something uh, we learned a lot about and continue to learn about really till the time uh, uh, the Obama administration ended. Um, a third element on that list I gave you was really about strategic communications. Um, we really realized that one of the most powerful tools we had, and I'm sure uh, many of you on the call know this from your own work, is the bully pulpit, the ability to talk to the public about doing what you're doing and to, to talk to regulators, uh, the regulated community employers about what you're doing. Uh, the next slide has an example of how we tried to translate uh, and make clear to people the importance of the work we were doing. We translated a lot of our statistics, our outcomes, into graphics, into ways of relating the information, not about a million dollars of back wage claims, but turning that into something like, 
what does the thousand dollars on average that we recovered per worker mean in terms of the number of paychecks a housekeeper received or a security guard? On the next slide uh, is another example of a graphic communication one of our very talented career members of our communication staff developed to talk about, well, what is the de being deprived of $1,000 of back wages mean in terms of a month's rent, of utility or childcare? Um, again, fundamental to strategic enforcement is telling the story, telling the story to the public, telling the story to uh, workers and helping them understand why it made sense to uh, come forward and work with uh, the agency. Um, and, and telling people like folks up in the Senate tell, uh, and the public about why the work was so important. Strategic communications is certainly something we learned and developed over time. Um, the next slide gives you just a sense of the kind of tools uh, that I would regularly review with members of my staff on where we were in progress. These are the rates of no violations for directed investigations across our five regions. And again, I would use these as a management tool for ongoing discussion and refinement of strategic enforcement approach. Um, the last slide I'd like to, to just point to, and then I'll stop, um, is a, a long list of different structural features of our organization. Uh, what it, were, were the sort of the nuts and bolts of making wage and hour work? Something that I'd be happy to take questions about and talk about is, the changes we made in everything from the kinds of investigators where we hired and new positions we created uh, to the kinds of capabilities we developed through training, uh, like data analysis, uh, ability to map and understand how industries were structured, uh, really a, a whole range of things that we did to innovate and change the way we operated as an agency. Uh, because strategic enforcement, as I've emphasized, is a different way of thinking, but it's also ultimately a different way of organizing oneself to do the task uh, of, of, of enforcement. Um, so uh, in closing, I want to say that uh, to me, the very hopeful story that I left with, while it's, it's always bittersweet to think back about what we were doing and, and what, how the world was changing a year ago, uh, one of the things that I think all of us at Wage and Hour took great pride at was uh, the growth and the change in our ability to do the things we needed to do as a regulatory agency uh, in order to achieve our mission. Um, and had we had additional years to, to continue to refine this, we would have learned further and we would have refined further. But I think uh, it's important for anyone, no matter where you're starting to understand, um, each step should be viewed as iterative on a larger road of, of uh, organizational change towards improved strategic enforcement to protect working people. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. You packed so much into such a short period of time. We really appreciate it. Um, every slide is incredibly valuable, useful. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to hear from some different states, and we're going to begin with Alaska. Uh, with Donna Nass, who's the wage and hour investigator at the Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Development in the Anchorage office. Um, Donna? Hi, good morning. Before we get into our slide presentation, I'd like to give you a, just a little bit of background. Uh, I'm Donna Nass. I'm one of 10 wage and hour investigators in Alaska. We are not attorneys. We don't work for an attorney, and we do not enforce our statutes and regulations through an attorney. We're an administrative and quasi-judicial body. We are both the regulatory and the enforcement body of Alaska's wage laws. We have jurisdiction to investigate contractual claims up to $20,000 and minimum wage and overtime claims for an unlimited amount. A few of the unique powers that our investigators have, we can enter a place of business to inspect and copy from any record relating to the employment of workers and to interview workers. We can issue subpoenas, compel the attendance of witnesses, and the production of documentary evidence. We can assess damages and penalties to violating employers, and probably very uniquely, investigators also have the jurisdiction to represent the state in small claims court. In November of 2015, the department started exploring and developing a strategic and pro progressive enforcement strategy but we took baby steps. Starting with the problematic healthcare industry, 
one investigator was designated as the point person for all enforcement issues in the health industry. Industry notices were developed targeting both new and established assisted living homes and personal care providers. Referral networks were developed, enforcement task groups formed, there is data sharing, violation tracking, and coordinated compliance initiatives such as joint agency site visits. In the handout material, uh, you should find a list and a description of those networks. And after our slideshow, I will uh, give you more information of where we are with our hair, uh, healthcare industry audits. As part of our strategic development, um, strategy development, we implemented a directed compliance audit program. The program was patterned after the USDOL's audit program. These are strategic audits as opposed to investigations that arise due to written complaints received by individuals. An audit may be performed as a full payroll audit or we may limit it to a specific group of employees or employment practices. So let's look at an overview of Alaska's very first directed compliance audit. If we could go to slide one, Taco King and Gallo's Mexican restaurant. As we progress through the slides, you should have copies of case study documents, which will fill in a lot more details than I'm able to provide. Let's go to slide two. The decision. In Alaska, there are six Taco King locations and three Gallo's restaurants that employ over 200 workers, mostly Hispanic, many non-English speakers, most earn slightly above minimum wage. Over the years, the department has sent multiple overtime non-compliance warnings to Mr. Gallo and conducted six overtime investigations. Mr. Gallo would comply, pay the wages, pay the reduced damages. In November of 2015, we received a new complaint about non-payment of overtime. The employer hadn't corrected their pay practices. Slide three. Factors considered. To ensure consistency in their new program and choosing an employer to audit, an investigator submits a request to conduct a compliance investigation. Our request must address four specific factors whether the alleged or suspected violation is systemic, substantiated, significant, and what's the scope. So we're looking at is this company-wide, unique to a specific group of employees or employment practices? Has the investigator received any substantive evidence? Is it egregious? Does the industry have a high rate of violations? What's the number of employees that may be affected? Are there criminal implications? The scope covers the period that the suspected violations occurred and whether the employer owned multiple businesses. In Gallo's case, he met almost all of those. Slide four. The process. A letter was initiated. You should have a template of our first notification to the employer. The notice informs the employer of our intent to conduct an investigation to determine compliance with one or more wage laws. There is an action needed section that instructs the employer how to prepare for the audit. The letter sets a date for an opening conference, which is the initial meeting with the investigator, and gives the employer specific deadlines and details of the scope of the investigation. The employer needs to submit some documents and information to the investigator before the first meeting. In this instance, the initial scope only required a sampling of pay records over two years. However, uh, prior to the opening conference, the employer's accountant admitted that the employer was not paying overtime correctly. Based on that admission, the audit scope changed and we covered a full two years. During the opening conference, we informed the employer that as part of the process, investigators would be visiting each business location to interview employees. We also made sure that when we left that initial meeting, that we had a current employee list with positions held, contact information, and employment dates and termination dates. That document was key to our success in the investigation. The other purpose of the opening conference is to get the employer to agree to the years and months to be audited. That's how we told the statute of limitations. Slide five, the issues. The employer kept trying to reschedule the opening conference. That was our first issue. 
During the opening conference, the employer stated that time records were kept electronically by two different POS systems. One of the systems did not report daily hours, worked only weekly hours. Alaska is a dual overtime state. We immediately directed the employer to correct this immediately. Resource was a second problem. We had an audit of 200 hourly employees, nine locations for a period of two years with incomplete records. It was going to be document and labor intensive. In this case, we allowed the employer to hire an outside accountant to prepare the audit for the department to review. While the audit was being prepared, we had received an anonymous letter that the employer was shredding documents. Also during this time, we, re we sent multiple investigators to all business locations on the same day to interview employees and to see if the employer's PO system had been fixed. In conducting the site visits and interviews, we found a multitude of compliance issues. Next slide. As the audits were coming in from the employer, we discovered some gaping holes in the reports. The employer intentionally excluded two of the restaurants. The restaurants were audited, but not submitted to the department. You can read the compliance audit summary supplement letter in the handout for details. Eventually, the audit uncovered uh, over $441,000 in unpaid overtime to 159 employees. The department assessed an additional amount of $394,000 in liquidated damages. The employer was permitted to deduct the cost of the audit and a portion of the attorney fees from the liquidated damages and was allowed to make restitution in two payments six months apart. He was required to sign a confession of judgment to secure the payments. A copy of that confession of judgment is in your handout material. As part of the investigation process, the employer is aware that the department will conduct one or more follow-up checks in the future to see if the employer has continued to apply, comply. We additionally had problems locating some of the employees. Next slide. The learning process. Each directed compliance audit that we've done has been a learning process. We've learned a few things. Securing a written agreement that tolls the statute of limitations, reminding employers of their responsibility to preserve records, streamlining the process of generating checks and locating employees. We also hired a technician to conduct audits. Next slide. In the Gallows case, our director did issue a press release and we did grant telephone media interviews. So moving past this, on another note, I, br I touched briefly on referral networks. We have found that referral networks and task groups are integral to enforcement in a few industries, such as the healthcare industry and possibly our new marijuana industry, where businesses can risk losing their professional and special specialty license if they're not compliant with wage laws. In the healthcare industry, we tend to do more pre-investigative work in assisted living homes and PCA violations than in any other industry because there is potentially more at risk than just wages. We have concern about patient care and labor trafficking it may take a priority over the collection of wages, but that's just one reason why our compliance networks and the industry uh, task groups are necessary. Currently, Alaska has one directed compliance audit in process with a PCA service company. The investigator has allowed the company conduct a self-audit and directed the company to do a two-year audit. However, the employer chose, chose to conduct a three-year audit. So far, the employer has discovered 57,000 in unpaid wages just for the period of January through August of 2017. The investigator estimates that uh, underpaid or unpaid wages will reach or exceed 200000 And in very recently, just a few days ago, a federal law enforcement agency referred, reported over to us two assisted living homes. The referral could lead to a compliance audit involving a joint employer relationship between three to five homes and four to eight employees. A decision on action on that is pending. We're still in the emphasis emphasis phases of our strategic enforcement, but we've really made great projects. We believe that these targeted enforcement activities will achieve better results for low-wage workers 
who don't know their rights or are afraid to speak up. Uh, for Alaska, directed compliance audits are definitely a more aggressive enforcement approach than we've used um, in the past, but we're proud of what we've accomplished so far. In our handouts, we've shared some of our enforcement tools, and I hope that um, in this very short period of time, you've been able to take at least one nugget from our experience. Thank you so much, Donna. That was fantastic. Um, it's so great to have you walk through it and to sort of show um, what an agency with modest resources has been able to do. So we're going to go right to questions now, um, and then we'll um, we'll resume with um, hearing from Connecticut and New York. So, um, Pronita? Sure. So uh, thank you for the questions and keep uh, typing them in. The first question I have is, how often are enhanced settlement agreements used to discourage future violations and to set an example for other employers in the same industry? And this is from Matthew Capice. So, uh, Alaska, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Alaska doesn't settle wages. Uh, we will negotiate on penalties and damages but employees are entitled to the wages that they've worked and we uh, don't negotiate them away. So at Wage and Hour, we, we certainly tried to move more and more towards enhanced compliance agreements at directed investigations and investigations where we had larger strategic ambitions. Um, sometimes those were crafted really from scratch uh, as we were trying to do in the Senate cafeteria case where we were trying to break some ground to have bigger impacts. But we also created during our time at Wage and Hour an inventory of enhanced compliance agreements and provisions that we hoped uh, our different district offices uh, could really fashion together appropriate combinations uh, of what had worked for us as pieces of other enhanced compliance agreements in the past, and we tried to not only um, have those available to all of our, our district offices and regional offices, but also increasingly we wanted to turn towards evaluating which ones really had impact and which one uh, didn't seem to have as much of an impact. You know, that, that again is one of those works in progress that uh, um, we, were, we would have pursued further, and I think it's an important thing for any agency that's trying things like enhanced compliance agreements uh, to build in with that some evaluation of their impact. Great. Pranita, second question? Sure. This is also from Matthew Capice. Um, it's asking David uh, or the other presenters to address some different ways of advising the public of violators and recoveries, whether it's through press releases or what other means are used. So we really expanded our use of different social media tools. We, we started to uh, tweet. We used lots of different blog devices. We had incredibly creative people at the department at the time we were there uh, who created videos and all kinds of different things to relate. Um, not only settlements and issues that came out of investigations, but larger initiatives like the work we did on joint employment and misclassification. Um, I think what was really powerful, Laura did some wonderful work on this in the home care area where she engaged stakeholders in creating uh, documents to help people understand their requirements under the new home care rules that we issued. Um, I think that the thing that united all of our approaches on social media was to try to understand who was who were who were the audiences we were trying to speak to and how could we craft our message in a way that resonated with those office, uh, those audiences? Whether it was trying to make employers aware we were serious about an area, uh, an industry or a practice uh, where we were putting a lot of enforcement or helping these people understand what their rights or their responsibilities were under the law, but trying to get into the audience's head rather than just trying to you know, trot out the same old news releases that had been done in the past. Donna, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, we also have a trends magazine, which is published by the Department of Labor, which goes through all sorts of labor statistics. And we have made uh, announcements and um, basically postured, positioned, if you'd say, letting the employers know that we have uh, increased 
and stepped up our enforcement on wage theft. Okay, we're gonna take one more question, Pronita, and then we'll move on to hearing from Connecticut and New York. Sure, so the last question from Kevin Shanahan is, could you discuss how you target industries and employers outside of complaints or data based on complaints? There seems to be vulnerable populations that don't know how or aren't comfortable filing a complaint. So how do you find those workers? Well, that's a huge issue. I mean, that's the whole reason why we moved away from complaint investigations. The people who are most, who you most likely need to go to are the ones least likely to actually uh, lodge complaints. We used um, a number of different measures uh, at the industry level to help us target which were the industries where we um, saw the, the largest number of violations or the largest likelihood that violations would be occurring. Um, and we used several different data sources, and I'm happy to share those in offline, uh, the kinds of data we used. Um, we also used information from our own past investigation hearings uh, precisely around what were the industries where we knew there were high violation rates but low likelihood of people complaining. Um, and that again combine, combined our internal information on who complained from what industry with publicly available information on um, other uh, on the number of people employed. But I would also say, you know, there's no magic one or two pieces of data. This is something underlying some of those improvements I showed in the slides. Um, we got better and better and our local offices got better and better using everything from media tools. Uh, we hired on a forensic accountant to help us use different sources of corporate information. Um, we certainly developed better and better relations with worker advocacy organizations who could give us uh, very granular information. It's sort of working multiple fronts of data, both uh, industry level and, and, and employer business level. Uh, to refine the game. Donna, can you tell us how you, um, how Alaska came to choose uh, restaurants and um, home care? Again, I'm going to go back to our referral networks. We have developed such uh, good working relationships that we have between the FBI, the U.S. Department of Labor, Child Support Services, Workers' Compensation, Troopers, Homeland Security, Fish and Game, uh, trade unions and community groups. Because uh, we're, we are so proactive in combating wage uh, thefts that all of these agencies, as they're out there and they see anything that even resembles uh, any type of a wage issue, uh, they refer to us. And sometimes when there is uh, something very egregious, we will actually form a task group of multiple agencies. A lot of agencies don't have the power to just walk in a business and look at records or interview employees, and we do. So um, it's our working groups and our referral network. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we're gonna move on now to our second uh, group of speakers. And let me just say, there'll be another opportunity for Q&A. So please, if you have other questions, um, please give them to us. Next, we're gonna hear from Risa Speziani, the field supervisor of the Wage and Workplace Standards Department at the Connecticut Department of Labor Division of Wage and Workplace Standards. Um, Risa, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I always like to talk about uh, what we're doing here in Connecticut. Can I have the next slide? So in Connecticut, we are kind of a one-stop agency. We enforce 163 statutes minimum wage, overtime wage payment, prevailing wage, stop work orders, and workers' compensation. So uh, many different states that split up amongst them here in, in Connecticut, one complaint can have many different components in it. It can be a prevailing rate uh, project that people aren't getting overtime or not getting minimum wage even on those. So we will, uh, in essence, send one agent to deal with all of those specific issues. In 2007, uh, the Carpenters Union got a law passed here. Our stop work order was passed, which has become a tremendous tool in our tool belt. 
So now when we go into a business and we find out our construction site and somebody's receiving cash, they are already committing fraud because they're not reporting those people as employees on their payroll. We immediately issue a stop work order. Now, if you want to get attention from a company, from a business, uh, stop their work, stop, close their doors, whether it be a construction site, whether it be a nail salon, whether it be a car wash, stop their business at that time and not let them collect that cash that they're looking for. And they will come into compliance very, very quickly. Our average stop work order is released in a day and a half. In that day and a half, they've put those workers on their payroll. They've obtained workers' compensation. They have paid any back wages due, and they have paid their penalties. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So in a year, we receive about 5,000 complaints. Those are complaints that come in for either, like I said, one of the 163 statutes that we uh, enforce. In addition to that, we do 40 to 50 plan sweeps a year. So we've designated a couple of people that are just sweeping companies. We collected, we are number three in the nation. We collected $8.9 million in wages last year, and we collected $1.7 million in collected penalties. Uh, we are only second to California and New York. So we're a very small agency, but it can be done with it, no matter how many people. When we started the stop work orders, there was just two of us that did it. We did over 300 that year and uh, collected well over a million dollars and probably close to a half million dollars in penalties the very first year. So it can be done with a very small amount of people. We arrest approximately uh, 75 to 100 employers a year. Uh, we are a law enforcement agency. Next slide. So one of our big things with our strategic enforcement is we've you know, certainly choose the industry. Everybody that's on this call knows the industries. They're, that does not differ in any state. They are the same. It's the construction, it's the bodegas, the nail salons, massage parlors, the car washes, the restaurants, and the bars. So I don't think that there's a state out there that can say that they have an industry that is different from every other state where there's, these are the cash businesses for a lot of, uh, in a lot of instances, and where there's cash, there's going to be cheaters. The next slide. So we've engaged a very uh, broad range of assistance. We work with the police departments on a daily basis, the state and local health departments, revenue services, DMV, we work with liquor control, any licensing boards. We work with the unions on a daily basis and any other business network that we can possibly uh, put our hands on. You know, as being, being a small agency, there is a lot of help available to different states, uh, whether they know it or not, reaching out to the different agencies. Uh, there's many task force. We're on a human trafficking task force, which has been huge with us with the massage parlors and the nail salons uh, that really is labor trafficking what they're doing to the workers there holding them in servitude so we've been working with uh, them we also work very very closely with the unions they are i always say there are extended staff there are eyes out in the field they know more about what's going on out there than, than we do they do a lot of referrals to us we have honed uh, what we will take from them, they know they just can't throw a bunch of things at us now. They have to do some legwork themselves. So that's been, you know, very, very helpful in in our enforcement, our strategic enforcement work. Uh, next slide, please. So our enforcement tools are these different statutes. We have the right to enter a place of business or employment at any time. You know, that may be at midnight at night, and that might be on weekends. Uh, companies are very, very surprised when we show up on a, a construction project inside a building at midnight. We'll do it. Uh, they are very surprised when we go out there on Saturday and we've been told, well, we know state people don't work on weekends, but we're out there because that's where, where the workers are. 
uh, 76A, we can issue subpoenas for any records. And uh, 69A, we have $300 per violation per incident, which we, uh, our Attorney General's office has interpreted to mean each time the person commits that violation. So every week that that worker didn't get paid or they weren't covered under workers' compensation is $300. So if you have 10 employees at $3,000 a week, it adds up very, very quickly. And, you know, hence the reason that we collected 1.7 million last year in penalties. And our stop work order, which has been a, just a tremendous tool for us. Next slide. So here's a particular construction site that we uh, were informed the union, actually one of the unions brought this into us. And everybody was working on that particular hotel. They were renovating that hotel and the workers were also from many different states and they were living in the hotel. And many of them had not been paid at all because in that industry, a lot of times the workers don't get paid until the project's done. And that's just, they know that going in there, a lot of the workforce are undocumented. So are, are afraid to say anything and just deal with the conditions that the employer uh, gives them. So in this, our stop work orders are specific to the contractor. So in this particular case, we shut down every contractor that was on the project. So that construction was ceased at that moment that that was issued. Uh, we also have a fine if they work in violation of the stop work order. And I believe last year we had about 14 of those. So uh, we did collect those fines too. So that's the Connecticut Department of Labor in a nutshell. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Can you just say um, quickly uh, how many staff you had? If you had to guess on the days in case, the number of staff hours that were put in on that case, what would you say? Well, that was probably four or five of us, and that was quite a distance. So we probably spent the whole day there. What has uh, one question that has come up when I've talked to other states is that they they have a tool or a similar tool, and they're afraid to use it because they're afraid that it's going to be administratively heavy. So they have a right to a hearing to dispute their stop work order in in the state of Connecticut, and they'd have to write in and they'd have to request that we have to grant them a hearing. Well, to date, we've issued over 3,000 stop work orders, and we have never, ever had one hearing. But, you know, these companies that get caught doing this know that they're caught. And, you know, for most of them, it's the, you know, the cost of doing business. So now they're caught, and now they'll come into compliance. But uh, we have never had one one hearing in, in 10 years now. Wow. Okay, Risa, thank you so much, and thanks for doing it in such a rapid clip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> close on time here. So. I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions for you. Um, and now let's just move on to Renika Moore. Uh, strate uh, at the, she does strategic labor standards enforcement at the Office of New York Attorney General. She's the Labor Bureau Chief at the Office of the New York State Attorney General. Renika. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think folks have covered a lot of the, um, the earlier speakers have covered a lot of what we do. So I'll try to tailor a little bit so as not to be repetitive. Um, we, we too uh, focus on a mission. Our mission is to enforce core workplace rights on behalf of New York's most vulnerable workers. And so that mainly means low wage workers, uh, immigrant workers, and workers of color. Um, we're not, unlike uh, the other speakers, we are not the primary regulator in New York State. That's our Department of Labor. Um, and so we take a more strategic approach um, in part because we have limited resources and we wanna ensure that we are, we are having the greatest impact. Um, so when we, uh, we both get complaints in and we also can direct enforcement. Um, and we will ask, does this, before taking an enforcement action on, we'll ask, does this further our mission? Um, and broadly, we consider what are the resources that will be required and what's the anticipated impact? Um, and that analysis might include, you know, uh, what you've heard before in terms of, will it affect a large number of employees? Will it change practices in an industry? Um, and we have both civil and criminal enforcement authority, um, and we primarily, most of our cases, um, most of our cases are for to recover wages for workers, so that's back pay. Um, but we also think about the legal impact of our work. The Labor Bureau is made up 
of attorneys. Um, so we don't have in the attorney general's office, we don't have labor dedicated investigators um, so that we, we, are all, we are thinking about sort of an impact litigation model. And to give one example of where we've used litigation um, that is ongoing is that we, you know, we're very much concerned about um, the fissuring of the workplace that David talks about um, and whether the appropriate parties are being held accountable. And so uh, we had cases that were brought to us as part of the fight for 15 and fast food workers organizing um, involving Domino's Pizza. And we began a multi-year investigation of wage violations at Domino's franchise stores. Um, and as part of that investigation, we uncovered the role of the franchisor in many of those violations. And so last year, we filed a major lawsuit um, of Domino's on a joint employer theory for the wage and hour violations at the franchise store. Uh, we, you know, we part of what we were able to do in that case is we were able to put a record before the court, and I'll talk a little more about our powers in a second, um, but put a record before the court um, that I think a worker uh, or even a class of workers would not necessarily have been able to do. Um, the, last, the last piece of, of what the Labor Bureau does is we defend the New York State Department of Labor in wage and hour, unemployment, and workers' comp appeals. So we, use, uh, we can use unemployment insurance and workers' comp laws to complement wage and hour laws to improve workplace conditions. Um, so I'm going to ask for the next slide. So the so our civil enforcement authority comes from New York Executive Law 6312 primarily, um, which authorizes us to investigate and prosecute repeat fraud and illegality. Um, and in the Labor Bureau, we primarily use that to investigate and prosecute statutory violations of New York State's labor law and federal fair labor standards law. We will we do use it for other laws, but those are most of our cases do fall under those those two statutory violations. Um, and under 6312, we have um, pre-filing subpoena power so that we're able to uh, investigate before we ever file litigation. We can subpoena for documents and testimony um, from an employer and third parties. Um, so the under 6312, our investigations are confidential, which is often very important to workers who are concerned about retaliation particularly for low-wage workers and especially for immigrant workers, um, this is something we take very seriously. And we, um, even once we uh, make a decision to litigate, we do think about ways to maintain confidentiality um, and um, ensure that we have, we have spoken with workers. Um, the last thing that we're able to do um, under 6312 that I'll note here is we can file summary proceedings. And what that means is that once we do file in court, we can file a complaint, but we can also essentially file a summary judgment motion at the same time based on the evidence that we've accumulated in our investigation. And so in our Domino's investigation, that's that's what we did. We filed the 6312 proceeding and we were able to put, um, you know, the subpoena documents and testimony that we'd recovered through the course of our investigation before the court and request um, judgment based on that record. So I'll ask for the next slide. And our criminal authority comes primarily from the labor law, New York's labor law and workers' comp law. And we're also able to prosecute criminally where we receive referrals from qualifying agencies. Uh, and that can, be, um, uh, that can be New York State Department of Labor, but also other agencies. Um, and we typically use our criminal enforcement authority in two scenarios, situations where there's an employer who, um, who is guilty of straight non-payment of wages, there's really no question, just did not pay workers, and or where we have an employer who is a repeat offender. Um, and the types of laws that we use include, um, uh, we've got failure to pay wages as well as various record keeping violations, so failure to maintain payroll records, often in the payroll, I mean, in prevailing wage cases, there's failure to keep other types of records um, and to properly certify. Um, and so I'll ask for the next slide. So we, you know, we do not, as I mentioned, have labor investigators. We also do not have the ability to enter or inspect work sites. We can basically only go where the public is allowed. Um, and so um, we've got certain staff. We have staff of about uh, eight to 10 uh, lawyers at any given time. And so, but in spite of those staff resource and kind of jurisdictional limitations, we are able to amplify our impact by working with enforcement partners. Um, and those partners may be governmental partners. So at the federal level, we've worked a great deal with the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, 
under the Obama administration and with David's colleague, David and David's colleagues, and um, and we've been able to complement our ability um, to do what we do. Um, and we work with municipalities and local agencies around the state. Um, and I'll just note, you know, to give one example, we worked recently on a case with the New York City Comptroller's Office, um, and their office is able and regularly does audits in prevailing wage investigations. And so we've been able to work in complementary fashion to, so that they are performing the audits, and we um, we have subpoena power, and we have um, often have a longer statute of limitations under Executive Law 6312. Um, so to think creatively about how you how you can complement your powers. Um, with those of other governmental agencies. We also work with worker organizations, so that is unions, worker centers, and plaintiffs' counsel. And we've been able to build some very productive relationships with uh, those entities so that um, we are able to understand what they do and explain what we do and what we don't do. Um, and those groups have been indispensable source of quality cases. Um, and particularly, I'll talk a little bit just about plaintiffs' counsel. We you know, often they're able to identify where there's a legal barrier to the enforcement of rights. And so one of the areas, for instance, that we've worked on um, in the last couple of years is the improper use of non-compete agreements. And that's an area where the private bar is generally not going to take on those cases because um, there's no provision of fees um, in some of the ways that it operates. So we like to think about where we can have an impact that is otherwise not going to be occupied by the private bar, um, or other organizations. And so some in, in terms of some of the things that um, that worker organizations and governmental agencies can provide, so they can facilitate interviews and have, in our experience, have facilitated interviews with workers. Um, they can provide and identify language translation services. Um, and often when we need to meet with workers, either to interview them at the early stages of a case through the end to providing checks at the end of a case, um, workers may be reluctant to come to government buildings, um, or they may simply not be able to for a matter of convenience. And so often organizations can help work with us to identify, you know, neutral, convenient meeting locations to, to meet with workers. Um, and they can also provide complementary investigatory tools. So um, as one of the other speakers mentioned, they can, they've often done background research on employers or industry, and they can identify other workplace issues that we may not have jurisdiction over, but that may be helpful to understand um, um, in terms of how, we, how to investigate this and what other issues we may be up against. And so I'll ask for the next slide. And so I'll, I'll, just, I'll end with uh, talking about the relief that we typically seek in our investigations. So we are able to resolve most of our cases before we have to file litigation. And we typically do that through what we call an assurance of discontinuance or an AOD. Uh, and in the AOD, the employer essentially agrees to stop all illegal activity and to come into compliance. And in our AODs, we often, we will reserve our right to prosecute if the employer fails to comply with the terms of the AOD. And, you know, first and foremost, we often, we're seeking restitution for workers. Um, so that's going to be back pay and liquidated damages. Um, we also frequently seek penalties on behalf of the state. Um, and that may be in the form of unpaid um, unemployment insurance contributions. And that could be workers' comp premiums that were not paid as well. In addition, we typically will seek to have postings uh, in the language that the worker understands in the workplace um, that, informs the workers of their rights against anti-retaliation um, and wage information as well. Um, we will often also ask for supervisor training and we have um, frequently asked for independent monitoring. Um, however, where the violations are less egregious or we're dealing with a situation with a new owner or manager um, or some other mitigating circumstance, we have allowed employers um, to have internal compliance monitors that we work with. And then lastly, we usually will include some kind of record keeping and reporting obligations um, that allow, that require the employer to provide us with information upon request. And we've, we've moved away from uh, arrangements where the employer was automatically providing us with reports, in part because from resource standpoint, we realized that there were times where we were not able to look at the reports as they came in. And, um, but there was an assumption if there was 
uh, some violations that were evident in the report that we knew of them or that we had blessed them in some way. And so we now um, switch to a model where we only ask for, uh, we only ask that that information be made available upon re request. Um, so, so that we're not in the position of, of, of being told, well, we had the information and didn't act on it. Um, so I'm going to stop there and leave Great. time for questions. Thank you um, so turn much. It back over. Uh, we've had sure. questions piling up, so um, we really, really appreciate your sharing with us. And um, we know that AGs are an incredibly important resource. And our colleague, Terry Gerstein, uh, an Open Society Foundation fellow, will be um, presenting in a future webinar about um, getting AGs more involved. So with that, Pronita, can you please... Uh, share the questions. Yes, thank you. The first question is from Craig Wright. Um, Louisiana recently enacted the Game On Task Force. Do you see the DOL partnering with more state agencies to combat payroll fraud? Absolutely. We've partnered with as many state and federal agencies as that we can. I like the name of that task force. Anyone else? Okay, next question. Next question, this is for Connecticut. Oh, oops, uh, sorry. The next question is for Connecticut. Can you clarify the legal basis of the stop work order? As a law enforcement agency, how can you prove non-payment of wages right on site? So we have the ability, right, that are there to verify if you know, number one, if they have workers' compensation. So if we're at a stop work order site or a site that somebody's complained about that they've been receiving cash or in Connecticut, we also have the joint enforcement uh, claim that people can already tell us that they've been receiving cash. So we know that going into it. We've checked their reportings. If they haven't reported that, we know that they don't have the workers' comp, so uh, we already know going in that they have not complied with the law, so we can issue right then and there. Because if they're receiving cash, they're under-reporting for means of committing fraud. Um, Pranita, can I jump in on something related? Sure. Uh, this is David Weil. I'm just, I, I wanted to pick up on something Risa said on the stop work that I think is really important. Um, because we had, you know, Risa mentioned that at first people were reluctant. How could you use this? Because it's going to be complicated. It's going to be contested. We had the same experience with two tools we really used as key parts of strategic enforcement. That was our hot goods authority, which allowed us to ask uh, companies not to ship goods where we had found violations of labor standards. And uh, even more uh, widely used our liquidated damage authority that's given to the wage and hour division by the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, both both um, uh, tools are very powerful tools. There was a lot of concern at the beginning about litigation and pushback by the employer community. Um, and what we did was we just worked very, very closely with the solicitor's office on protocols that we were using these tools exactly as the statute allowed us to, and in ways that were very legally defensible. Uh, and I can tell you, we had, uh, particularly in the case of liquidated damages, we had nowhere near the pushback we expected through litigation. And, and, uh, and the more we used it, the better we got at using it within the law, within what we were authorized, but in a way that we it had enormous and great effect. And we, we never lost uh, a challenge on that authority. Wow. Pronita, right. next question? Yes. Next question is, again, from Kevin Shanahan, and I believe it was for Renika. It's, can you speak more about non-compete clauses in contracts? What have, they, what have you been able to accomplish and what tools do you have at your disposal? Sure. So we non-compete provisions are usually we're seeing them more and more with rank and file employees. They're provisions that say that an employee cannot go work for um, a competitor in a particular geographic area for a particular length of time. And so we've taken enforcement actions under 6312. You know, we've used our the ability to to investigate fraud and illegality, and we're we sort of looked at it under the fraud model. Um, because the, under New York law, it's, and it, it is generally based in state law, um, when non-competes are enforceable, but is only supposed to be used to, to protect trade secrets, 
um, or other confidential information. So we've brought enforcement actions where um, against Jimmy John's most notably, but also against Law 360 that was using it for their um, low level employees. Um, and it was unclear that they had any access to trade secrets. Jimmy John's is a sandwich shop. It does not, you know, it, so essentially, you know, their employees are college students um, in many of the stores that we were, we were looking at. And um, it barred them from working at any other sandwich shop, including other Jimmy John's owned by other franchisees. Um, and so we were able, um, using 6312 to open investigations and then to some extent using our bully pulpit to, to stop employers from, from working with that. And in the case of Law 360, we were able to work, that's another example where we work with um, the Writers Guild, the, the workforce was under, was um, going through an organizing campaign um, and to work with them to identify witnesses um, and to evaluate whether the non-competes were being used appropriately, which we determined they were not. Um, and Law 360 ultimately agreed to stop using them for the vast majority of their workforce and essentially just limit it to their CEO and the, the, the kind of C-suite high-level employees. Um, so, so that's kind of how we were able to do that. And we continue to have investigations and we get more and more complaints from more ridiculous employers on that front. Um, next Great. question. Yes, this is for Risa. Uh, what are some of the charges that employers have for non-compliance? On the stop work order or just on, on uh, non-payment of wages? Why don't you address both of them? Okay, on a stop work order, it's if they've under if they've misclassified workers as independent contractors, if they've underreported for means of committing fraud, or underreported in a different classification. So, you know, we've gone on construction sites where there is 20 guys on the roof, and everybody's classified as a clerical, or they're paying their workers comp as a you know a group of clerical uh, employees, thus you know saving them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So, and then on the uh, wage payment laws, it's non-payment of wages, weekly payment of wages, um, you know, failure to pay overtime, minimum wage, whatever, you know, whatever the violation there. Great. So we have one last question. Um, what additional strategic enforcement tools or approaches are used to counter employer retaliation that workers face for filing complaints? And I think this is open to all the speakers. Uh, can we start? Uh, why don't we just run through everybody? David? Well, I mean, that was certainly something we were deeply concerned about because of its chilling effect. I mean, back in the day, we worked closely with the Department of Justice, where there was retaliation connected with violation of other, um, other federal rules, um, to the extent that we even had cases where we followed up retaliation cases with having people wear wires and things like that. Um, I think also um, retaliation where, again, it was tied to a more egregious pattern of violations. Often that's the case where there were other bigger problems. We would use those as opportunities to really come with everything we had at those employers um, and, and, and make the restitution of the case, the enhanced compliance agreement, and other activities that followed the case really focus on the violation of that basic right as part of what we would want to see remedied in the future. Um, and then we would also publicize the hell out of it because uh, if there's one message that you want to get out, all the more hard in the current environment is that workers have rights, regardless of their immigration status, to be paid basic. Uh, according to the labor standards laws of the country. Thanks, David. Um, Donna? Alaska has a statute which makes it prohibited under Alaska law to terminate any employee for inquiring or asking for their wages. However, it does not have much enforcement uh, teeth behind it. How, but we do uh, communicate it to employers. And when we go in and do our directive compliance audits, we make sure that that employer knows that they cannot terminate any employee uh, that cooperates with our investigation. But if we received any pushback from it or if it were to happen, uh, that employee would probably have to retain an attorney and pursue like a raw, 
wrongful termination claim. Risa? Yeah, we have whistleblowing connection it, it, protection here in Connecticut. I do recommend for any of the outside interest groups when they're trying to, you know, to help a group of workers, certainly they can be the active person filing the complaint or presenting the information if they're fearful of those workers. We recently had a case where, um, you know, the, we did assist with the, the worker getting his visa because, you know, he did come to us and was, you know, one of the whistleblowers. So, uh, you know, in, outside interest groups can assist uh, the workforce in bringing in those claims too without, so they kind of remain anonymous. Renika? Yeah, so we have statutory protection. So we've got both civil and criminal liability for retaliation, which we definitely use. We also, you know, try to treat where it's happened and we, we learn of it quickly. We will, you know, make a call. We will act quickly, um, separate and apart from like the legal hook, but letting the employer know, look, this is not okay. And we're going to come after you for this, which has sometimes been able, we've been able to get um, workers rehired if there's a short span of time. Um, and so just being just being able to have that quick response can sometimes address the issue. Um, otherwise, you know, we have a, a, a case where there was um, immigration threats related to immigration retaliation. And so we um, we've taken, a, you know, a more holistic look at that employer, including some surveillance and taped conversations. Um, and so we do take it very seriously and use kind of we do deploy all the tools in our toolkit when when we do have reports of retaliation. We've done several webinars on retaliation, and um, we will go back to that topic, um, I'm sure, again. We've come to the end of our time, and we just want to say thank you so much to um, our amazing presenters today. We know that you put a lot of time in, not only to preparing your presentation, but to thinking about how to get it so much information into such a short period of time. Um, CWO and CLASP will be back with more webinars in the coming year. We welcome your ideas and suggestions about topics you would like to, like to see us cover. Um, so please stay tuned in 2018. And also just to let you know that we will be planning to do a series of strategic enforcement and partnerships between agencies and organization trainings regionally throughout the country in 2018. So please stay tuned for that as well. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, happy and healthy holidays. Uh, and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.